Amen. Well, it's good to see you. Uh, Super Bowl. How many of you are going to be watching today the Super Bowl? Oh, we got the majority of you being Super Bowl fans. Well, uh, we have a couple of people that are in the church that are throwing Super Bowl parties, and I know that those will be a lot of fun. I can tell you this. Uh, we were going to do that as an annual tradition at, uh, at my home. And that kind of got knocked uh, out as a plan a few years back uh, when we had the church projector. And in those days, we would use the projector to put things up. Well, we have these little projectors now, but this one was a massive one projector that we'd have way back in the back because it was like a movie uh, theater projector. And we brought it into the basement of our home. And we put that Super Bowl up. I'm talking bigger than life. It was on the entire wall. And at halftime, Janet Jackson made her debut. <laughs> That's not a church party. I can't invite people to things like that. So it kind of knocked us out, you know, as far as being able to, to have the Super Bowl annual party. Um, February, wow, is right. February uh, is, is, uh, is the month where most resolutions are let go of. February is the month where people begin to settle back into the ordinary, uh, begin to go towards mundane rather than the excellence of the resolutions that they wrote down and that they uh, desired to accomplish in the year uh, 2012. We're going to see it. The people will just stop going to the gym, stop going to work out. Uh, they'll stop their reading plans in the Bible. Uh, they'll stop church attendance. They'll stop uh, with other things. They'll go back to some of their old habits. I want to challenge us towards something, and that is the last month we've been talking about the discernment of the Spirit, been talking about wisdom, been talking about how it is that God has certain laws and rules that if we will enter into God's rules and laws and, and see things from his perspective and do things by the book, so to speak, by the Bible, then we'll find ourselves being blessed. And I want to encourage you as your pastor, I want to encourage you with all that's within me, go after excellence, don't let go in the month of February, amen? amen. I want to talk about perseverance today. And, uh, you know, so many people find it very easy to start. We get excited about starts. Starting is not hard. Starting really is not hard. What is difficult is to persevere in, in moments when we feel like giving up. In moments that seem so ordinary, we're not as excited as we were when we were stirred up with, with those initial first steps. The enemy always loves to come in when something is first beginning and first starting. We knew that. We came out to uh, launch the ministry here in the D.C. metro area coming from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I can tell you that there were moments where people would say things, and those things could be easily great uh, factors of discouragement in our hearts. But we decided not to allow that to discourage us, and we just kept going on. Um, there's a, I know that there's at least one person in our congregation that has... Uh, sought to uh, go up to Mount Everest. Just by a show of hands, has anybody climbed Mount Everest? By a show of hands. Do we see any hands? Okay, there might be one in here. I don't know if he's with us today. But I can tell you this. Just to get to base camp is a big deal. I was actually in the area, um, you know, and we did some, we, we marched up into just the, the basic bottom areas of some of the mountains that, uh, were there in that area. And I, I remember we were witnessing to some of the groups that really seemed kind of tribal. Uh, and we were sharing the gospel with them. And it was just a, a wholly different experience than anything that I had experienced before. My travel partner got absolutely dehydrated. And he was given something in a silver packet. And, you know, you're kind of at the mercy of the, of the hospitals and doctors when you're, you know, traveling abroad. But boy, I'm telling you, whatever that was, it worked well. But he was out for a couple of days before we got him that packet, uh, not feeling too good. And then when he got that packet, he was able to go up into the mountains with us. And it was amazing. But I never got anywhere near base camp. I respect those who make it to base camp. That is a major, major deal. But I can tell you this. Base camp has comforts that the rest of the trek up do not, does not have. And a lot of people in going up the mountain will stop at base camp 
but it's the few that go past. And again, I take my hat off to anybody who can even make it to base camp because that's a major deal. You've got to be in perfect shape to be able to do that type of thing. But to go further than that are the elite few, the ones that are able to make it to the top. I've got a great letter, handwritten letter for, from uh, Sir Edmund Hillary. And I asked him, when was it that you knew you were going to make it to the very top? And he explained in this handwritten letter to me about when he first knew that he was going to make it to the top, when he had the confidence that he would do it. And it was just a, you know, a moment that shook the world as to what can be accomplished and that we can do more than we think that we can. Well, I want to encourage you, don't, don't stop at base camp. Don't stop where it's comfortable. Go further than that and go to where you can get to the top. Be challenged by the fact that God has excellence in store for you. Now, we all know the story of the tortoise and the hare. Uh, we have a, a tortoise, uh, we have a hare. And uh, they're both going along, they're trying to win the race, and we know that the tortoise is uh, seemingly slow but methodical, stable, consistent. We know the hare is a little bit uh, out of focus. I mean, there's a lack of focus, and the hare is, you know, going off and doing various things, just so certain that he'll beat the tortoise no matter what. And in the end, we know that the tortoise beats the hare because he just stays consistent and keeps pressing through no matter what. I think there are a lot of distractions in life that would cause us to want to go in different directions, lose our focus in February, and not be consistent in the things that God has called us to. But God will give us victory if we will persevere and if we will be consistent in what he's called us to do. So again, I want to speak a little bit today about that perseverance. Let's look in Ecclesiastes. In the ninth chapter, in the 11th verse, the Bible says, I have seen something else under the sun. Remember Solomon being the wisest to ever live. He says these words, listen to him. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. In other words, he's saying it's not based on the world's uh, sense and terms of what brings success. Instead, he says, and he's trying to make the point, that life is meaningless. We're all thrown into just a confusing situation in which life, in the context of what he's saying here, is just seemingly meaningless. I want to say something to you. God brings meaning in the midst of chaos. God gives you purpose in the midst of what seems confusing to you until you realize that he strengthens you to be able to win the battles that you're facing. Some of you are facing battles. Some of you are facing things that are struggles, and you're trying to figure out, how do I get through? And not only how do I get through, I don't want to just hunker down. God, I want your healing power. God, I want your victory. I want to be able to help others who have gone through difficult times. I've known what it is not to be able to have a, a, a you know, shelter over my head, meaning I know that. That's my testimony. That's Bill Shuler's testimony. I know what it is with my mom doing her very best to raise us that there were moments in which we lived out of the car. I understand that. There were moments in which we didn't know how we were going to get groceries. We, we didn't know how we were going to get our next meal. Some of you know my story. My mom saying, hey, guys, it's saying this to my brother and myself, we get to have pie filling tonight for dinner. And here it was the last thing in the house. She made it exciting. She made it something we wanted to do. We opened the blueberry pie filling. I still remember it. With getting our teeth blue and our mouths blue, and we loved it. My brother and I had no idea we were being challenged by f hard financial times. But I still remember this, that as we ate that meal, my mom slipped away, went into her room, it was down the hall, and as, it's as vivid as if it were yesterday. I looked down the hall, saw her in her room, and she was on her knees in prayer. She knew it was the last meal we had in the house. I understand those difficulties. Some of you come out of testimonies of challenging times. You're in one right now. You don't know where your next uh, paycheck's going to come from. You don't know how you're going to get through the things that you're trying to get through with your roommate or even your spouse or your family. You don't know what you're going to do to be able to get over a crisis that's so private and so confidential. Only you and maybe a few others know. 
But I want you to know that we serve an awesome God. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? And God is for you and not against you. You are the head and not the tail. That deserves a clap offering to the Lord. And so, uh, but there's something that really hit me at the beginning of the week, and that is this. It's not just about perseverance. It's not just about that. You know what it's really about? Do you remember the movie Jerry Maguire? Any of you see Jerry Maguire? Okay, God's going to judge you. No. Okay, I've used that joke so many times, but it hits every time. Okay, um, with the movie Jerry Maguire, remember what she said, uh, he says to her? You complete me. Do you remember that statement? Uh, some of you may go all the way back in your memory to a movie called Love Story. And in that Love Story, you know, Ryan O'Neill says, says to Ally McGraw, uh, or one of them says to the other, I don't remember, it was so long ago, uh, love means never having to say you're sorry. Uh, and then now everybody says that's one of the dumbest statements, you know, what, is, <laughs> what does it mean, you know? But, but in this idea with the Jerry Maguire movie, you complete me, that's been mocked a whole lot since then, you know? And a lot of what uh, self-help people say is, oh, that's the most stupid line, you complete me, because really, you're completed by yourself. You're strong in and of yourself. You complete yourself. You don't need another to complete you. And in that, they're trying to say you're empowered. I want you to know they've got it wrong. There is a completeness, a factor of completeness, but that completeness comes in Christ. That completeness comes in your relationship with God and your identity that is found in Jesus Christ. Now, this really hit me at the beginning of the week. And I want you to hear this as more than just we persevere I want you to hear that God is into completing what he begins. That he that began a good work in you will complete it. And you can be confident that God doesn't leave you hanging. God doesn't leave you where you are right now. God is behind the scenes on your behalf even at this moment. But I'm telling you, I always recognize that when we come to that moment of looking at the Christmas story that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, hundreds of years of action by God to bring about what would be his son coming on the scene. Characters like Herod, and, 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 you, and you see you know, the different ones that come in, the wise men, all of these things coming together. And it would bring about the fullness of time. All of this, the orchestration of God. Why? Because God has never let go of his plan. We see that as well in the book of Exodus. As the cries go out to God and the cries are there because the the people are enslaved. The Israelites, the Hebrew people are enslaved. And we see them in that enslavement. And then Moses, the great deliverer, comes on the scene, sets them free, sets them in the direction of the promised land. All of that, that powerful, powerful story. But I can tell you, it took time. But God was always at work on their behalf. God had not let go of them God has not let go of you. And that completeness factor is built into the nature of God. So if we will work with God, we can know that the only one who can say it's failure time and it's over is you. For God is your senior partner. He will carry you through when you least feel that he's there. He will carry you through when you least understand why you're going through what you're going through. He is there on your behalf. Some of you need to hear that as a direct word to you right now. God is here for you now, and he's all over your story. And he's orchestrating things to bring you to a place of victory. He is the one that will complete you. And he's bringing you through to a place of completion in your life. So in looking at this, uh, the Bible says in Hebrews 11.30, uh, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. And by the way, faith is such a, mm, such a strategic thought. We need to be talking more about faith. I'll, I'll bring some messages on faith. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them how many days? Seven days. Joshua 6.15 says the, these words. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. This concept of seven is the idea in Scripture of, and you know where I'm going with this, completeness. 
God is a God that cares about completing what has begun. When we get a revelation of that, we will no longer feel like giving up or feeling like he's no longer there for us in what we're going through and he's just going to leave us partially built up. But instead, we'll see that even in the now of our lives, he's taking every element of what was there in our past that makes us unique in our DNA and bringing us to a place where we have victory in the now and hope in the future. That is what God has for you. Amen? Amen. That deserves a clap as well. And it even deserved a better clap than that. Okay. Matthew 18, 21 to 23 says this, and it's about forgiveness. Peter is asking, how many times should he forgive? And the answer is this, by Jesus, 77, or another way of saying it in translation, 70 times 7. In in other words, Jesus is saying it's endless. So is God's work on our behalf. It's endless. It has not stopped. Even in the area where you think you've seen no movement, God is at work. Even in that area that you've given up on, or that person you've given up on, and that person may be you yourself. You've given up on yourself. God is at work. Even in the dreams he stirred up that you think are dormant and maybe they were just you, God is at work. He's a God that completes us. Don't let go before he lets go and know that he never does. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a work in you will carry it on to what? Say it again. Completion. Completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, Jesus hasn't come yet. We're not at that place of being in the new heaven and the new earth. You can know that Jesus, uh, God is at work on your behalf right now. Jesus is interceding on your behalf. The Holy Spirit is here as our divine helper, the one called alongside to help. Isn't it awesome to know the Holy Spirit is here to help us? You are not alone. You are not alone. I almost sound like a 12-year-old there. You are not alone. You are not. In the Old Testament, Joseph, his story begins with a dream, and it begins with great favor with his his, uh, father, and, and we see that story. What an awesome beginning. But then that story, maybe if it was a Disney story, it would end there. You know, happily ever after feeling. But the reality is the story doesn't end there. What happens next is he encounters some major challenges. His brothers want to kill him. He's thrown into a pit. He's sold into slavery. He's lied about by Potiphar's wife. He's thrown into prison feeling like his reputation is smashed to the ground. Then he's forgotten And you look at all of these things, but think about how it ends. When we see the ending, we know that he has risen up to be second only to the favors, uh, 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 to the Pharaoh. And we see that he's the one who saves God's people alive in a generation. Isn't that a great story? Well, it shows that God was at work completing him. It shows that God never let him go. Then we see in the New Testament, Peter, a fisherman called to be a disciple. He will betray Jesus What a horrible, sad thing to be said about your life story, that you would be one that at any moment would betray Jesus. We see the woman who questions him, are you not one that was with him? And he denies that three times before the lady. But then, 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 don't let him go there. Don't let go there. Don't stop there. We see that as it goes on, this incredible sense of God taking a hold of that life and showing him, he never let go of him. He's carrying him through the Pentecost, and Jesus stands there. I'm sorry, Peter stands there, Jesus inside of Peter. We see Peter standing there and launching the early church. What a wonderful testimony of where God brought him through in his life. In Galatians 6, 9, the Bible says says, uh, what the number one reason is for people who who give up before breakthrough. The Bible says, let us not become weary in doing good. I don't know if you're weary today. I don't know if you feel like, you know what, I'm just tired. I mean, it may be the beginning of February, Pastor, but it's not just resolutions. I just feel like letting go in a lot of areas. There aren't even resolutions. And I think God has a word for you today, and that is he's completing you. He hasn't let go of you. He's all over you, and he's going to carry you through. He's going to give you the victory. In Romans 5, 3 through 5, the Bible says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Now, that sounds so strange, and boy, that comes against some of our theology, that we would ever glory in our sufferings, but what does it mean? It means that we recognize 
that God can take what the enemy means for our harm and turn it around for our good. Boy, we see that with Joseph. He saw that his brothers meant to put him into the pit, even kill him, sell him off into slavery until he goes into oblivion, is forgotten altogether and thought to be dead by his father. But Joseph understood what it was to have God at work on his behalf, even in his sufferings. If you're going to get past base camp and really go to the top, you're going to have some difficult wins. You're going to have some challenging times. You're going to feel like giving up. I think anybody who would be honest, stand before you, would say that they've been tempted to give up, tempted at times to just let go, go a different direction, give up on their faith. Give up on prayer. At least give up on believing greatly for something beyond the blessing of your food. But God wants you to know he's calling us to excellence in February as well. He's calling us to go from glory to glory also in the now of where we are. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So I want you to know there's a reason for what you're going through. Don't let go. God is carrying you to an end result of hope. And if your hope has been taken away, I think that's one of the biggest places where the enemy tries to work. He tries to take your hope away and your joy away. And if you're here today and you feel like your joy has been taken away and your hope has been taken away, I want you to know greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We serve an awesome God and he is fighting on your behalf. You're not alone. You are not alone. Not only is he fighting on your behalf, he'll call out angels on your behalf. Boy, I even spit a little to say that. You need to know it. This life is characterized in different ways in the scriptures. We see that this life is characterized as a race. Have you ever felt like you're just kind of out of breath? You ever wondered whether you're going to finish the race, much less finish it well? There's a a clip that Lisa showed me. Maybe we'll show it at some point in the church of about four or five women that are in a race. And it's a true, it's a real life story. You see the race, and, and maybe some of you have seen this. And all of a sudden, one of the runners, she just falls. She takes a hard stumble, and she's down. The other racers do what you're supposed to do. They just kept running. She gets up, and she starts running. She's so far behind. And yet you see as she begins to make up space, and then the next thing you know, she overtakes one, overtakes another, overtakes another, and comes in and wins at the end. A believer. I want you to know... That's where some of us are at. We've fallen. We've stumbled. We've hit hard. It hurts where we're at right now. But if you'll get up, you can know that God is the one that sustains you. God is the lifter of your head. He's that strong tower you run to. You can know that hope is ahead if you, going through suffering, will not let go. It's a process we see in that scripture that we read just a moment ago ago, of suffering going all the way to a place called hope. Now, the next thing we see is that life is characterized as a fight. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been a boxer or really been in a fight. Do any of you remember what it was like in junior high and high school? I always felt bad when there was a fight because, you know, all the students would gather around, they'd get in a circle. Then if a teacher was coming down the hallway on one side, this side of the circle all crowded into that side to keep the teacher from being able to get there so that they could, you know, yell on at the fight. Have any of you seen what I'm talking about? And I'm thinking, I was always the guy wanting to thin it out on the teacher's side because I felt sorry that some guy's getting, you know, pummeled, if that's the word, down on the ground. I always had this compassionate sense inside of me of, come on, he's bleeding. What in the world are are we doing applauding a fight? Well, some of us feel like we're in a fight, feel like we've been hit. Let's look at the scriptures. 2 Timothy 4, 7, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. He understood that it was like a fight to go through this life and to to not only maintain your faith, but to walk gloriously in your faith. I have finished, and here it is again, the race. I have kept the faith. That's our testimony. When we get to the end of our lives, we're going to be able to say that we have kept the faith and we have finished strong. Amen? Amen? Life is a test. Life is a test. This will speak to my girls and others who know what taking exams is all about. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. In all this, 
you greatly rejoice. Here's that joy factor again. Isn't it interesting seeing it appear over and over again? We're meant to have joy. We're meant to have hope. Even with the headlines of today, we're meant to have absolute joy and hope, even in struggle. We're meant to have joy unspeakable. That means it's hard to even talk about it. It just comes from a place that goes beyond coming from mere uh, natural means. It's the joy of the Lord that's inside of our hearts. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So that there you are, get a picture of yourself in the future. This is who you are. In the future, you will stand there as Jesus returns. And when you see Jesus returning, you will be strong in the faith. You will have gone through suffering and trials and other things and known God's delivering power, God's presence. And you'll stand there and you'll give him praise. And you'll worship him. And there'll be a moment of giving glory to your Lord. That's who you are. That's who you are. If you let go, how will you know what it is to be able to stand there and triumph at that moment? You must let God take you by the hand and lift you up even now. So each one of these speaks to this concept, again, of perseverance. Perseverance, the definition is this. Steady persistence in adhering to a course of action, a belief or a purpose, steadfastness. Well, I know you guys to be steadfast people. This is the concept of perseverance. There are two concepts to it. One is active. One is passive. Maybe this will help you with some of the things that you face in life. So listen to this, because when you go to the biblical language, you'll find that there are two meanings to it. The active meaning of perseverance is uh, pressing through, that concept of, of pressing through something that's difficult, but by the means of, the, of that momentum and energy of the Lord, I'm telling you, you're just able to find yourself pressing through in something. And then there's the passive sense. That is a sense of long-suffering, a sense of patience, a sense of saying, God, in my timing, I'd get this, rid of this right now. God, in my timing, I would be able to do this, you know, just, just have the victory instantly. But God, I'm walking through in faithfulness and steadfastness before you. I am long suffering in it, knowing that you will give me the, the victory, but I will not let go until I see the victory. God is a, is a partner with you in that. The New Testament Greek word for endurance has the idea of being patient with people. Now, patience there in the Greek in the New Testament is this concept of, again, being patient with a person or people. Some of you, that's what you're facing right now. It's a need to be patient with somebody. I don't know if you identify with that or if you're sitting right next to him, but, but you need to learn what it is to be patient with somebody. Sometimes the most difficult people to be patient with are the ones that you care about the most. Sometimes we're rudest to the ones we love the most because we're always with them. And we don't treat them always with the same sense of respect and honor as someone that we're first meeting or somebody that we don't know as well. But that sense of being patient with people is something that you're empowered by the Holy Spirit to do. And so the Holy Spirit gives you that strength to persevere. And when you have that strength by the Holy Spirit, you can know that's applied to people. Now, here's the other concept of that sense of endurance uh, in the Greek in the New Testament, and that is long-suffering with circumstances, long-suffering with hardship and difficulties that you face. So one is the concept of being empowered in endurance by the Holy Spirit for, in regard to dealing with people. The other has to do with dealing with circumstances. And sometimes it's the circumstances that would bring us down if we didn't have the strength of the Lord. And some of you are right there right now. It's a circumstance, not a person. It's a circumstance. And, and if you could give your testimony, you'd be filled with tears. And you'd feel like, you know, I'd love to give the testimony saying I'm out of this. It's in my past and it's done. But pastor, I got to be honest, I'm going through it right now. But the endurance factor that we're talking about that's spoken of in the biblical language in the New Testament is that the Holy Spirit will empower you when you need endurance and strength in the midst of difficult circumstances. 1 Corinthians 13.4 says these words, love is patient 
Love is kind. And then in the verse 7, the Bible says it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always what? That's God's love. God's love is in you. When you have God's love in your heart, you can know you have the strength to always persevere. You know, if I could persevere in 70%, That's good, isn't it? But this says always persevere. In everything, persevere. That's the love of God that is in our hearts. That's the power of the love of God that is in our hearts and the love that we have towards others that emanates from him. Why this concept of endurance? Why this concept of needing, you know, this race thought, this this fight thought, this test thought? Why are those things analogies? Why is this life sometimes so challenging and and difficult? Well, in Revelation 2.26, speaks of a reward. Listen to this. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over nations. Boy, sometimes I just want authority over my, you know, remote control. (laughs) That may be where you're at today. Your TV goes out. You want authority. I mean, you know, it's Super Bowl. I need some authority here. Now we're thinking too small. It's time to recognize that God can give you authority over nations. See, that's that thing we go back to from a week ago. You know, here's Abraham praying this prayer. If there be 50, if there be, and narrowing it down, if there be 10 in Sodom that are righteous. You know, that's a sense in which he's speaking out over a people group. He's speaking out over the righteous in his generation. We need to pray prayers out of an authority that gives you authority over nations. That's what we see in the scriptures is that's the reward that is here. It's a place of leadership and a place of authority in kingdom activity. Practical practical aspects, here we go. Number one, we need to fix our eyes on God. We need to fix our eyes on God. We know the scriptures say to fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. In Hebrews eleven twenty seven, 27, we see that if Moses were standing here and we'd say, Moses, what's the secret of your success? You went through so much. Most, Moses persevered because he saw him who is invisible. That makes no sense. <laughs> Sounds like a love means never having to say you're sorry comment. Come on, Moses. You can't see what's invisible. Yes, he could. Is God invisible to you right now? You wonder where he is? Do what Moses would tell you to do. He stood here today in his robes, holding on to his Ten Commandments. I don't know why he'd need to do that, but if he was standing here with his beard and his robes, thundering as a mighty deliverer, because let's face it, they didn't have audio systems in that day. He needed to have a really strong Charlton Heston voice. (laughs) He'd say, I'll tell you my secret. You don't think I felt like giving up? You don't think I felt all the people around me that were giving up? Pointing a finger at me, saying that I had made it worse for them than what they knew when they were slaves in Egypt? You don't feel like I felt, like giving up. But I saw the one that is invisible. He never left me. He was always there. I want you to know, we need to get some spiritual eyes going and see that God is here for us right now in this hour. Amen? Well, there was a time when I was at ORU as the chaplain there, and some of you know that this is a little thing that I used to use in counseling, but... I would have students come in and they'd share all types of things from not being able to get the grade they need in order to maintain their scholarship and therefore they're losing, you know, a full ride scholarship for four years that was built upon the concept of them having their grades at a certain level. I had someone come in and tell me they're losing it all and they feel horrible with that because they didn't keep their grades up. Didn't, they weren't serious enough. Now their family is weeping because they don't have the money to keep them in school and here they are in their freshman year. I had some of that type of stuff. I had counseling to talk to somebody who was at the wheel of a car. There they were, the other students in the vehicle. They were going through Arizona. It was sometime 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. Everybody was sleeping. 
This girl fell asleep too. Next thing she knows, she's awakened to the car flipping and tumbling. The one girl that was in the back seat that didn't have the seatbelt on went right through the front windshield. Killed instantly. Now she feels guilty. What do I do with this the rest of my life? I'm marked by this the rest of my life. I have such guilt. So many things that we see that, you know, I would counsel in those days. Remember I had a little tiny elephant. That little elephant, I'm not talking a live one. A little tiny, I think they call it soapstone. It was something I brought back from India when I was there. And I would have that on my desk. And oftentimes I would take that and I would put it up and I would say, when I take this and I put it up right here in between my eyes, I can hardly see anything but that. I can still see some things in the peripheral, but that becomes everything I see. I said, that's the same with the crisis that you're facing. Right now, we need to put it back into perspective. Now, let me do the flip side of that for a moment. Psalmist says, come magnify the Lord with me. What does that mean? Let's make him big and in charge because that's who he is. Let's not make him small. He's bigger than all that we could imagine. So we bring the Lord right here. All of a sudden, we see the world still, but there's this overwhelming sense in which the Lord is there on our behalf, even in the midst of the most difficult times, the greatest challenges that we go through. I use that so many times. Sometimes perseverance is really a story of perspective. The next thing that's a practical point beyond placing your eyes upon the one that is invisible is the second thought of imitate those who model excellence in their walk with God. And You know, I think that in my life, I've applied this from time to time. You know, so many of you know, Billy Graham is a spiritual hero of mine. I've had the opportunity to be with him personally and to watch him, and I watched him when people weren't around. I saw the way he dealt with people when nobody was watching and no cameras were there. I saw the humility in the man. I saw the dedication in the man. I saw at one point when he lost his temper and then asked forgiveness of an entire crowd the moment he did it. I watched those things. So that I could learn. Is there someone that you know, and I think everybody should know somebody like this, where you've seen that there's been an excellence in the way in which they have walked with God? You can see the results in their lives. You can sense it in their prayer life. You can see it in the way that God just uses them to bless people wherever they go. Imitate that. Paul said, follow me, but he didn't just leave it there. As I follow Christ. As long as you see Jesus over my shoulder, he's saying, follow me. I am an example, Paul said, and he wasn't ashamed to say it, nor was it arrogance. I'm an example of one that walks before the Lord, going after this in such a way as to win this race. And I dare to say, follow me. That's what he was saying. You know, uh, Sydney, our youngest girl, And I have been reading through, and Lisa at times as well, the chapters in the book, The Hiding Place with Corey Ten Boom. And we're not quite through with the book yet. I keep saying to Sydney, don't you need to read the next chapter? Because it's more based upon when she needs to do a report on it. But I want to get through the book, you know. I'm all excited and can't wait, although I know the end of the story. But we're watching as this family, with Corey Ten Boom being one of the daughters, goes through the most horrific of experiences as Nazi Germany takes place in World War II, and the Nazis come in, and, and the next thing you know, this family is, is placed into death camps. And Corey's sister, Betsy, dies in the death camp. And we see this testimony where God used this lady, Corey Ten Boom, the rest of her life to be able to be a powerhouse for him. I think Lisa's wondering down here whether I just gave away the rest of the story for Sydney. Sorry if I did. Betsy dies. Okay. (laughs) Well, let's just be honest about it. Everybody in the story is dead now. It's an old story. Okay, well, I mean, just because of time. I'm not giving it away. What a shock, anybody. Hitler's dead. Let's pray. Okay. Corey Ten Boom. 
C.S. Lewis. You may name somebody that stirred you. Maybe it's somebody in your family. It's your mom or your dad. Maybe it's a grandparent. And every time you think of them, you're just hungry for God. You just want to know God better. You just want Jesus to be able to emanate through your countenance and through your words. You want to be used like they have been used. It's not a thing of pride. It's not a thing of big numbers. It's not a thing of being renowned. What it is, is it's being authentic in your faith to run this race in such a way as to win. The next thing that we see is that, and the last point that's a practical concept, is that we need to maintain our confidence. Hebrews 10, 35 through 36 says, so do not throw away, what a term, as if it were just a rag that was used or a paper towel, wipe up something and throw it away. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Again, that word perseverance. And he will give you what he has promised. Boy, he's given promises. They're these precious gifts. They're wrapped beautifully. Now let's unwrap those gifts and walk forward and and not lose our confidence. God is at work on our behalf. He's at work on our behalf even now. He doesn't leave us at that place where we feel like we crashed against the rocks. That's not who he is. He doesn't leave you in a place of feeling incomplete. Only we leave ourselves there. Isaiah 61.3 says that God makes beauty from ashes, gladness from mourning, praise from despair. Isn't that awesome? Beauty from ashes? Somebody ought to become an artist and and do their art out of ashes. Maybe that's been done. Okay, that has nothing to do with anything, but I was just thinking, making something beautiful of ashes? If something has imploded, exploded, incinerated in your life, and it's a dream, it was a hope, the belief in, in something attached to God being there for you, God makes beauty of ashes. And even that concept of in your mourning and in your grief, he brings worship, brings a sense of praise and gladness. Paul's sentiments are these. He's speaking to the church at Colossae, the Colossians 1, 9 through 14. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. This is my prayer for you. Listen to this. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit. That's another message I'll bring. In every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people. That's so great. A cloud of witnesses. You're to share with the inheritance of Moses. You're to share with the inheritance of Abraham and Esther, of Daniel, of Joseph. You're to share in the inheritance of Paul and of Peter and the disciples. That's who you are. They were just flesh and blood, but they did not give up. They did not let go of their confidence. They held through till the end. That's your inheritance. The Bible says, again, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us to the kingdom of his son he loves, whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. sins. 